Yeah, I'll say hello. Uh, hello. <laughs> So it started now, Brad. Brad? Okay, I'll get started then. Yeah, thank you, Ru. Uh, my name is Brad Hayes, and I'd like to speak to you today about uh, energy transitions. How do we power humanity in the future? Uh, I'm the outreach director with the Canadian Society for Unconventional Resources, and energy transitions have become a very important question for us as they are for many people around the world. Uh, obviously, we are in a situation now where uh, supplying safe, sustainable, reliable energy in the future for humanity uh, everywhere from uh, uh, wealthy nations like our own to lower income nations around the world is very important. And it's, I think it's very important to take a global and a practical view of how we power humanity in the future. So let me get started with a, a really obvious statement here. Modern humanity needs energy. If we didn't have affordable, reliable, uh, plentiful energy, we'd still be living in the proverbial caves and we wouldn't have all of the, uh, all of the things that, uh, uh, that, that support our lifestyles today uh, either in our, our own, say, wealthy nations or in developing nations around the world. So we need to have energy. And our supplies of energy around the world are extremely complex. This uh, diagram, uh, there's several versions of them available. This is from a consulting firm in Norway called DNVGL. Uh, and they talk about world energy flows in 2018. So over on the left side of the diagram, are uh, representatives of our primary energy supplies or where our energy comes from uh, around on a global basis. So you can see that just proportionately with the size of the, uh, uh, of the, the big arrows or the bars here, uh, oil is a, a huge contributor to the energy picture. Coal is as well. Natural gas, slightly less. Uh, biomass, uh, less but still very significant. Uh, nuclear in the purple color, hydropower are all uh, bars that are significant enough contributors that we can see some, some thickness in, to the bars. Uh, other sources of, um, of energy, the wind in light blue, solar photovoltaic, solar thermal, and geothermal are all in the game, but they are relatively small contributors on a worldwide basis, on a, uh, a volume basis um, altogether. We take all of those primary energy supplies and go through a number of different transformations and conversion processes to come out the other end at the various uses that we have for them, such as uh, transportation, uh, industrial applications, and buildings in terms of space heating, water heating, things like that. Uh, as we go through the processes, many of our primary energy sources are converted to electricity, uh, which is in the second column from the left here, outlined in blue. And we can see quite obviously that most of our primary energy sources, uh, part of them actually go into the production of uh, electricity uh, that comes out the other side and is used in manufacturing buildings and so on. So that's the state of things in 2018 very heavy reliance on uh, hydrocarbons and coal, uh, less so on what people call traditionally renewables, including hydropower and then nuclear as well. As we move ahead into the future, there are many major challenges ahead of humanity, again, on a global basis. Uh, these certainly aren't all of them, but they are some of the very key issues that we are concerned about, about sustainable development, uh, moving forward, adding to people's lifestyles uh, in a way that's sustainable from environmental and, uh, and just simple quantity of material point of view. Uh, energy poverty is a critically important question in many uh, lower income nations where people simply don't have enough energy available to them to live uh, a lifestyle that includes uh, electrical lighting, uh, machines, computers, and things like that. And then of course, climate change is a major concern, uh, a major challenge of our time in moving forward uh, with uh, trying to minimize and adapt to the effects of climate change. And in reality, energy transitions 
overlies or intersects with all of these major concerns. Every one of them has energy transitions from what we have today in the hydrocarbon and coal dominated world to a more diverse set of energy solutions in the future. We can view the transition of today's energy to future energy uh, under uh, an idea that involves two competing realities as it's called for transition. And this, this uh, idea, this observation came from the positive energy group at the New University of Ottawa under the leadership of Monica Gattinger. And reality one point of view is that energy transitions will be measured, gradual processes, they'll be driven primarily by market forces, but they will be supported by policies that direct uh, people, industry, governments to transition their energy sources without imposing excessive costs on people or, or, or running businesses out of money and things like that. So that's one viewpoint. A second viewpoint that's observed by the positive energy group that many people hold is that uh, energy transition is an urgent process because of the climate crisis that the world faces. And so our transitions can't wait to be driven by market forces. They have to be driven primarily by strong and rapid policy interventions, uh, including things like carbon taxation and other directives that, uh, that reduce uh, CO2 emissions in order to achieve uh, the energy balance that we want in the future. So as an observation, most developed or upper income or OECD nations today are working with reality one and Canada is one of those where we are certainly, we have a lot of um, uh, proposals, we have a lot of policies in places to reduce carbon dioxide emissions. Uh, we've talked about doing more extreme things in the future, like uh, out, outlawing uh, internal combustion engines and raising carbon taxation to very high levels. But we are talking about those in the future. Those measures have not been uh, enabled as of yet. Many developing nations around the world, lower income nations, are not focused on the energy transition. Their focus uh, is more driven by energy poverty and the availability of energy. So their focus on their energy uh, supplies in places like uh, Pakistan, India, China, uh, other nations, uh, particularly African nations, is obtaining a sufficient supply of energy uh, to lead a modern lifestyle. And the reality to commitments, in other words, uh, proposed policies, to enable a very rapid energy transition are being proposed in many places now. And we hear about them, as I said before, in Canada, in California, in the European Union. Um, but all of these commitments are future commitments. There are very few uh, policies, and I'll get to this right at the end of the presentation, that are in place now to actually drive a reality two type of transition. Just looking a little background behind Reality One. So Vaclav Smil is a distinguished energy researcher. He's a, an emeritus prof at University of Manitoba. And he has studied the change of energy, changes of energy systems over time and says that history shows that basically energy transitions take a long time. They cannot, you can't change your primary energy and the way that you use it, such as conversion to electricity in a very short period of time. The, and in fact, more specifically, today's energy transition towards decarbonization will be the same. It will be a gradual prolonged affair, taking into consideration the technologies available and the time that it takes, uh, time and money and planning that it takes to and actually put new practices into place. From the Reality2 perspective, there are many proponents of a rapid energy transmission and their uh, their focus is to modify energy supplies to meet emissions goals like those set out in the Paris Agreement. So you can go to Carbon Tracker and read their report on the speed of the energy transition, where they make the case that they feel it's possible for rapid energy uh, source uh, changes. They don't address the, ide the ideas of SMEAL in terms of uh, the length of time it, it takes to undertake an energy transition. It's just, it's simply something that doesn't come into the equation in, uh, in their publications and, and presentations. And they specified 
that in 10 to 30 years from now, uh, the world will be using much less oil, gas, and coal, uh, and we'll be using uh, more of uh, low emissions or non emitting energy sources. And another agency, the International Renewable Energy Agency, or ARENA, has a publication called Global Renewables Outlook 2050, where they, they go through and show how they feel these things can happen. And in fact, here are, uh, here's an extract from that, that report uh, that talks about, well, what pathways can we find to zero energy and process emissions by 2060 in this case? And what they do is they go through a number of different areas in, in, in different categories. So you can read along the bottom, where's my arrow, there we go. Uh, like, you know, by converting to renewable power, for example, on the left here, we can reduce uh, global ener uh, CO2 equivalent emissions by uh, two gigatons. And uh, st structural and behavioral changes uh, around industry can another big contributor and so on. So they outline a variety of areas where it, you can sort of take the carbon emissions down towards zero by making changes in all of these different, uh, different things that humanity does. The, the issue though is that it's a, it's a planning or a scoping document. There aren't any project pathways built into it. So the, the report does not include what do we build? Uh, where do we build it? How do we pay for it? How, you, you know, it's one thing to say, we're gonna reduce uh, power generation uh, emissions by two gigatons, but that means that there are going to be certainly a very large number of specific uh, generation projects, specific storage projects and so on that will have to come on stream. And there isn't a, a, a roadmap or a pathway to actually show us where those are going to be or how they get paid for. If we're going to engage new pathways then and come up with those answers as to where are we going to put new things? How are we going to pay for them? There's a bunch of questions to be answered. Uh, and they're fundamental questions. What energy sources will we actually use to achieve humanity's needs going forward? What, which of those choices will best balance the cost, not only the monetary cost, but the externalities, the, the unpaid costs we have around pollution uh, and climate and things like that, the accessibility to the energy, uh, environmental protection outside of simply uh, climate change, and security of supply. All of these, these uh, uh, factors have to be considered or questions have to be asked. How can we bring interests together to achieve the balances and in what time frame? If we're going to address global issues, it has to be global solutions. We have to have agreements with other nations. We have to tie our energy grids together and do things like that in order to have a chance to make rapid progress on energy transition. What technological advances will happen? And I'll show you right near the end, there's many, many, many uh, technologies that people are trying out right now in energy production, energy storage, energy utilization and saving to contribute to the overall solution. But which of them are gonna work? Many of them are just concepts or pilot stages right now. And what role will unpredictable world events play? And up until recently, uh, you know, some of these things seemed fairly remote, like a political unrest or globalization, things like that. But the pandemic, COVID-19 pandemic, has obviously been the most uh, remarkable event in terms of world energy supplies and sourcing uh, for a very long time. Uh, and it's happened you know, completely unforeseen over the last year. And even events, when I say uh, uh, natural events, well, the, the big uh, Arctic storm in Texas uh, over the last week or so, I mean, totally unforeseen uh, until just before it happened. And pretty clearly, uh, we came away from that with the understanding that the systems that uh, Texas has in place for energy supply are simply not adequate to meet the, um, meet the requirements of a big uh, natural event like that. So how are we going to be construct systems that are sufficiently robust to, to address issues like that. And when we really dig down into it, we have to undertake a critical analysis of the facts, the risks and the costs versus benefits of each solution that we propose. And everything that we do today has to, or everything that we do with an eye to the future has to work for us today. So if we say we've got a target, for example, of being uh, zero net emissions by 2050, well, that's, that's a good target to have and we can work towards it. But we have to keep in mind along the way that for every minute between now and 2050, 
uh, the world has to be supplied with that same amount of safe, reliable uh, energy uh, all the time. We can't, we can't all of a sudden just drop out a supply for a while where we change over facilities or something like that. So it's, a, it's an ongoing issue. And one of Smeal's, uh, Vaclav Smeal's observations is that energy density is really a key. Energy transitions that have happened over time from the earliest days where we simply had human labor to uh, gather our food and, and, uh, and do everything that we had to do uh, up until today when we've adopted these increasingly uh, dense energy solutions such that we've got to the point of bringing on coal and petroleum and nuclear, we actually had industrial revolutions as they uh, radically changed the amount of energy available to humanity and the number of things that could be done. So it's going to be a real challenge moving forward to replace energy sources uh, with other ones if, they, if the new ones don't offer comparable energy density. And we're seeing that issue play out and be addressed uh, today, for example, in, uh, in vehicles, you know, a conventional internal combustion engine uh, vehicle, uh, you can probably get five or 600 kilometers uh, absolutely reliably out of a tank of gas in many vehicles that are at least reasonably energy efficient. Uh, and many of the uh, electric vehicle uh, battery makers are still struggling to, to get to that sort of level of both reliability and durability, uh, energy density, if you will. Now those problems, specific problems, are being addressed with a great deal of success. The batteries today are much better than they were before, but they're not there yet. And this energy density issue uh, is with us across all, factor, all segments of society, not just vehicles. So a couple of really basic facts, again, to, to keep in mind here uh, while we make our plans. The world population is expanding and overall energy demand is increasing. And I've mentioned this a couple of times, people in lesser developed or lower income countries want the lifestyles afforded by high energy consumption. I've been fortunate enough to go to India a couple of times myself, most recently a couple of years ago, and I spent some time in Delhi. And you can see, I mean, all of the technology that we have in, in Canadian society is in Delhi. They have workstations and vehicles and, and buildings and things just just like we do, but they've only got a few and most of the population can't afford to access them. There's not enough energy to run them. Uh, and, and people yeah, just can't afford to have them. So all of those people aspire to have the same sorts of things that we do. And that's really nicely categorized by this map showing that close to half the people in the world lack access to reliable electricity services. Some countries like India and Pakistan, they've got lots of electricity and electrical grid in that, but it's highly unreliable. And the company I worked with in Delhi a couple of years ago had backup generators in their office building because they simply couldn't trust their computer equipment and, and all of their other uh, necessary uh, machines for working to the local grid because it wasn't reliable. And in fact, because of that, as we look forward, and there's many different uh, projections you can see, this is one by the International Energy Agency, as we move forward to 2040, uh, energy demand in lower income countries is predicted to be huge, uh, a huge growth throughout most of the world. And the only areas where energy demand might decrease, albeit by a much smaller amount, are in the higher income nations of North America, Europe, and Japan, and Australia, New Zealand, where we've already achieved uh, enough energy density or enough energy supply to keep us happy, and we're kind of into energy saving mode. We'll convert more, more to electric vehicles, uh, higher efficiency appliances, better heating, and things like that. But in the developing world, uh, energy demand growth will continue uh, in, uh, unabated. And that's why there's more than 350 coal-fired power plants currently under construction globally. And you know that most of them are in China, India, Africa, and Southeast Asia, because those are the places that need energy uh, growth. And they need to, to have every type of energy come on stream in order to meet their demands. And just to illustrate the point, why do people want reliable energy? It's not, it's not simply so they can lie around and watch Netflix. It's because 
they don't have sufficient energy in many parts of the world to have the things that we take for granted as part of a basic life, like good education, healthcare, food, access to water, transportation, and so on. And in fact, this, this United Nations Needs Survey was run a few years ago, shows that uh, out of 10 million people that they surveyed worldwide, uh, action on climate change was a concern of, was the 15th most important concern of that group of people. Now you can go to this website, you can filter uh, by nation, by age group and so on, and you will certainly find that in many places, such as if you, if you filter for uh, young Canadians, you'll find action taken on climate change is much higher up the list. But this is the global list. And so it's something we have to keep, keep in mind again when we're addressing a global issue. Moving away from the developing or the lower income world, the existing energy supply chains and infrastructure that we have today are complex and they've been built at huge costs and we can't simply change them out or discard them overnight. On top of that, people that do live in countries like Canada, the United States and Europe, we've attained a certain lifestyles and nobody wants to go back. They don't want to make significant sacrifices to reduce their energy demand and reduce the things that they can do. And you can ask people in polls about how much money they want to spend to reduce their climate, their energy consumption. And very few of them want to spend more than a few dollars a year, a hundred dollars a year or something like that. And what I think is much more telling is you look at the way that people uh, in our country and in the United States act or their behavior, or what they spend their money on for, and here, from uh, 2019, you know, 2020 statistics aren't terribly reliable because of COVID, but the top three selling vehicles in the United States were large uh, pickup trucks uh, and no electrics among them, at least at the time. I know the electrics are coming out now, but people are still buying huge gas guzzling vehicles uh, on, at the same time as saying that they're concerned about the climate and have to do something. If people are truly concerned about emissions uh, and climate, they, the only reason or the only way we can believe that they truly are concerned is if their actions show that they want to uh, contribute to energy reductions. And in fact, a huge variable in the predictions of future energy demand is how well governments or groups or people themselves can persuade the majority of people to reduce their energy consumption to be more efficient with what they've got. There's no doubt that it's possible to do more with less energy, but people actually have to take action to help that happen. Now let's, let's move forward to look at uh, the actual energy supply scenarios uh, into the future. So this is uh, from uh, BP's 2020 energy outlook. There are many, many different scenarios slash projections that you can pull down to show how much, uh, how much of the different energy types we'll be using uh, 20 or 30 or 40 years from now. This one's pretty representative in that they, they put out three different scenarios. One they call business as usual. One is rapid energy transition. Another is net zero emissions uh, transition. So all of the scenarios there envision a huge growth of renewables. The orange bar that in 2018 on the left is very small becomes very large in all of the cases by 2050 on the right. The business as usual uh, scenario is one that I would consider to be a, a positive energies reality one. We're moving forward. We're definitely shifting towards renewables, um, but we're allowing you know, people to do as, as they want without too much constriction. And we see that by 2050 under that scenario, which I've, I've labeled as reality one, overall energy consumption goes up quite remarkably. Renewables increases hugely, uh, but just about everything else grows to some extent too. Coal and oil are actually substantially smaller, but gas has expanded as is nuclear hydro uh, and renewables. Uh, the rapid transition or the net zero transition uh, scenario see a much greater growth of renewable supply uh, to the point that in the net zero emission uh, scenario, probably greater than 50% of our energy would be supplied by renewables and much, much smaller fractions uh, to the point where coal and oil have practically disappeared. Now, again, that is a renew that's a reality to scenario. 
Uh, BP has suggested this is something we could look to, but again, as I made the point early on, there are no pathways defined to actually achieve that scenario. Nevertheless, it makes for a, a very, you know, a very good planning tool to look at and understand what, what can we do? So the big question here, I think, is how quickly can we grow the supply of renewable or low emissions energy? Let's look at what, re, what, what limitations we have. I mean, there's no question that there is a great deal of will, there's a great deal of money being spent to bring on more and more renewables projects. You know, I get newsletters every day showing me big new offshore wind projects and big new solar projects. I mean, things are hopping out there in the renewable world, but there are limitations. Uh, last uh, October, first snowfall of the season, I took a stroll down just by my house here and at the Bears Paw Operations Work Center, uh, just out at the west end of the city, uh, south of Tuscany, you can see uh, a solar panel, solar project, it's got a 50 kilowatt uh, capacity, but on October 24th, it was producing nothing because all of the panels were covered in snow. They hadn't been dusted off yet or they hadn't melted off yet. So nothing coming from that, uh, that and that highlights the fact that the, the biggest limitation I'm sure you've heard about with, re, with renewables, at least with wind and solar type renewables, is intermittency. We need electricity all of the time. And this particular facility is producing no electricity at this time. And in fact, if you go to look at the, at the uh, history or the progress of uh, solar and wind uh, generation in Alberta, uh, here's a snapshot from 2019, but you can go to Reliable AB and pull this down for any time period. I thought this was interesting. It's the middle of the summer uh, uh, in August, solar generation, nice sunny month. So we have 15 uh, megawatts of solar generation capacity at the time in uh, Alberta. And uh, at noon every day, uh, when it's sunny, it pretty much peaks up and it's all producing and that's great. But of course, every night the solar goes to zero because the sun's not shining. And on days like this weekend here, when I was out camping, I clearly recall, uh, and it's raining, the solar capacity goes down or the solar generation goes down quite a bit. The capacity is still 15 megawatts, but you're only getting out two or three because the sun's not shining. Similarly for the wind, our wind generation capacity at that time was over 1400 megawatts and it's quite a bit higher now, even just a year and a half, two years later. But you can see, that uh, very rarely does the wind blow sufficiently that 50% of Alberta's wind generation capacity is actually engaged. Now, you know, if you look across the entire year, you'll actually find that, re that wind has a much higher uh, generation capacity factor than solar, simply because if I pulled a solar generation uh, graph for this time of year, the peaks would be much lower. Uh, simply because the sun's so low, you don't get nearly as much uh, energy out each day. So because of that intermittency, we have to have huge storage capacity to capture excess power when it's available and to provide sufficient power when renewables aren't uh, online. And we have to talk about multiple storage technologies. I, I was talking with our host just before we started today and talking about batteries, which are, are great. And we hear all sorts of things about battery technology. But, but we need other things too. We need pumped hydro, we need compressed air energy storage. There are many, many interesting and potentially highly valuable new schemes of energy storage coming on. And many of them are being developed, but the current capacity is tiny and can operate only for short time periods. I saw a quote the other day saying that the United States today has enough uh, total storage capacity to run the country for 14 seconds. Well, we got to do better than that. I know it's early days, but that's where we are today. So we, because we don't have enough storage and we're still figuring out how to do that, we need backup dispatchable or on-demand generation capacity to be in place so that adequate power is always available. And that's what did not happen in Texas this week, and which is why it's so much news, is that their backup capacity failed to come online, uh, wasn't adequate, whatever the planning issues were, and so they had big problems, particularly because it was so cold. Now the storage technologies as say are, are many and are amazing. Uh, they go from hugely, you know, sh very, very short duration, millisecond type things like uh, superconductors and supercapacitors, flywheels and things like that. Battery storage, lithium ion and other types of batteries will last from minutes to hours. 
And it's not until we get up into things like pumped hydro and compressed air and even a manufacturing a synthetic gas or manufacturing hydrogen as a storage medium that we've got energy that we can store for hours or days or weeks and fill in those longer term gaps. So we're addressing the short term or the load leveling aspects of uh, with storage right now. And that's really good. It makes the systems much more efficient. Uh, but in the longer term, providing electricity through days and weeks when renewables are not generating, we haven't even begun to approach the, the, the issue yet. One of the really cool things that we're talking about is pumped hydro storage. The idea of taking water uh, when you've got abundant, let's say, solar or wind energy, and uh, taking water and pumping it back up into a hydro reservoir so that it's there to be let out again to generate power when we need it, say at nighttime or when it's not sunny. And there is, uh, TransAlta has a proposed uh, pump storage project going at the Brazo Dam near Rocky Mountain House. And it's been used for quite a long time in Europe uh, to help balance their electricity grid. So it's a great it's a great idea and more of it can be done, but obviously it's, it's limited to very specific settings where you've got this sort of topographic relief where you can put a big reservoir up high and play it out to a river or some kind of receptacle down low. Uh, so it's one of the things that we rarely hear about, which is quite important. In fact, the, the graph I showed you in the last page, pumped hydro is 96% of the world's storage capacity today by the amount of electricity it can put out. So it is important, but it's still just one of the minor components. And when we don't have that sort of storage, then the, again, the idea of backup generation, how that plays out in Alberta is that in the winter, and this was at the end of 2018, start of 2019, you can see that Alberta runs almost entirely on natural gas and coal for the electrical generation. Through that time in green, we had some amount of wind uh, capacity on online and it was definitely through over New Year's and early January wind was a significant factor but right around Christmas uh, and between Christmas and New Year's and then again later in January it was calm probably very cold too the wind contributed nothing hydro contributed almost nothing solar essentially nothing solar's under other here uh, so we we need that backup generation and even in places where there is a very much greater renewable capacity, renewable supply, let's say Denmark or a country like that, where we've got great uh, offshore wind or say uh, Costa Rica, which has incredible hydropower, they still go offline sometimes. There has to be backups to, to uh, systems to come on stream. And the backup systems now invariably are thermal generation, burning coal, burning gas, uh, because we know that we can turn them on pretty much at a click of a switch. Renewable sources, just like other big projects, face development issues. And so I've just listed out a couple here, and, and some of them are big and some of them are small, but I just want to give you uh, a feeling for you know, the scope of things. I mean, there's a, a big wind, early wind power project off of Fukushima in Japan that they put up and found out that basically it wasn't economic. I'm sure when they built it, the, the, um, uh, the capacity, the, the technology wasn't as well advanced. Perhaps they could put a new modern wind turbine system in that same place today and have it be economic in terms of the power that it would put out, but they failed first time around. Uh, one big issue, in, in, uh, particularly in Germany, is that they, they have their electrical grid tied into many other countries. And when they bring on these highly intermittent renewables, it's great when there's lots and lots of solar and wind power coming in, but the electricity grid has to deliver what people demand all of the time. Uh, the times when uh, solar and wind are huge and the times when solar and wind are zero. And so it, it becomes a very, very difficult balancing act. Finally, uh, in, in terms of, of limitations to really quick engagement of renewables is it takes a lot of stuff to build what this author calls energy machines. So if I want to produce a terawatt hour of, of, um, uh, of energy or of power from a particular source, I need to use a lot of materials. In the case of solar vo photovoltaic, I need a fair bit of concrete, I need a bunch of glass, I need a whole lot of steel for all the frames and, and mounts and everything like that, and then some other stuff. 
with hydro, not surprisingly, to produce a terawatt hour of, of uh, electricity, I need a huge amount of concrete and practically nothing else because basically I'm just building a dam and so on and so forth. What, what's really more important than the, the absolute volumes here is that some of these uh, other things, particularly in solar and wind, are critical metals or rare earths. They are uh, elements that are difficult to source, uh, that come from relatively few places on earth, and supply chains for them simply are not in place to build the type of facilities that we would like to build uh, with today's technology. And so it's been concluded by a number of analysts that we just cannot exponentially grow global renewable energy production with the technologies we've got today and our abilities today to uh, produce metals. So that's great for the mining industry in British Columbia. It's really, uh, and Ontario, it's really spurring them on. But uh, even British Columbia and Ontario don't have as much uh, cobalt and some other rare earths that we find more in places like Central Africa and in China. And uh, supply chains to those are gonna be very much impacted by geopolitics. So we have to keep that in mind. So uh, just to finish that little segment off and so I can wrap up here, remember that our energy flows are very complex and that this discussion about renewable energy sources, the solar, the uh, uh, wind and so on, and I'll talk for a sec about geothermal, um, they, they address only electricity supply. So every, all of these ideas are going into electricity. Now, obviously what we want to do is to grow the component of electricity that we use and reduce the, uh, the direct uses like uh, liquid fuels, for example, and gasoline and so on. But nevertheless, all of the renewables that we're building today uh, address only parts of our energy needs. And often we see statistics that get a little bit confused between total energy supply and total electrical supply. So just to sum this up then, uh, the IEA uh, in their tracking clean energy support uh, report, pardon me, looked at progress in alternative energy sources. And they identified 46 different technologies that are required to reach long-term sustainability goals. And so these technologies would include things like uh, electrical vehicles, uh, like uh, advanced uh, solar vo uh, photovoltaic and so on. So, and they found that only six out of the 46 technologies identified were on track to actually meet reality two sustainability goals. Another 24 showing some progress, but 16 of them, we just weren't moving at all. This is a very interesting report and I'd urge you to look at it. The fact of the matter is that there, there's many, many different things that go into an energy transition and we're thinking about all of them, but we're making significant progress on only some of them. And as, along the same lines, the Brookings Institute uh, in 2020 uh, talked about uh, looking at the, the pledges that uh, 100 largest UF cities have made to uh, greenhouse gas reductions. 45 of the 100 largest cities have actually identified reduction targets, but two thirds of them are either lagging, uh, they're not meeting their targeted emissions level or they're not even trying to report them. So again, we're not making the progress we need to make. Even in, even in the early days. Similarly, the uh, research and development spending to achieve net zero emissions in some of these non-electrical applications like shipping, trucking, uh, steel manufacture, cement and chemicals, uh, we're just, we're not progressing. We don't have the technologies that they, it's, the IEA says we have to develop new technologies that are not currently in commercial use if we want to tackle the emissions issues in these areas. And my conclusion, from all of that uh, review is that the pathways that we need to reach reality two goals, that rapid energy transition and goals like zero emissions, zero net emissions by 2050, the pathways aren't in place. We set the targets, we're talking about them, but we are not doing the things that need to be done to actually make them happen. That doesn't mean that nothing's happening. Lots is happening, but lots more needs to happen. And it's not just spending more money, or, or shutting down an oil pipeline, it's actually developing new technologies, putting them in place and making them effective. So just to, just to sum up, what alternatives do we have? We've got lots of alternatives we're working on. And you've probably heard of many of these things uh, of, of extracting CO2 from the air, uh, tidal and wave generation. One I think is really interesting is Quidnet and clean tech geomechanics are actually looking to 
to uh, pump uh, air into the subsurface or pump fluids into the subsurface into artificial fracture systems or into well bores or things like that, and then uh, flow them back out again to turn uh, generators. It's a bit like doing pumped hydro, but instead of pumping the water up above ground, you're pumping the fluid down below ground under pressure. And when the pressure is released, you can flow it back and gain energy. Um, I know I'm coming to the end of my time here. So uh, Ever uh, is developing geothermal technology. That's a Calgary-based company, and they've just raised a lot of money from major international energy companies with their geothermal technology that allows us to get geothermal energy from the subsurface economically, even in places like Alberta, where we're not very well suited to geothermal energy simply because our subsurface, our, our sedimentary basin is too cool. It's not hot like it is immediately underground, say in uh, California or in Iceland. Uh, there are these other uh, research things going on for energy storage and so on. So that, you know, all really cool stuff. Uh, carbon capture and storage, CCS, is a huge uh, uh, discussion point in terms of capturing carbon dioxide from the air or more realistically from industrial processes before they escape into the air. And indeed, it's working. The Shell Quest project near Edmonton has sequestered more than 4 million tons of CO2 in its four years of operation, taking emissions from the industrial heartland refining complexes just northeast of Edmonton. And it's even better if we pump the CO2 underground and use it to enhance oil recovery. But we're, you know, again, this technology has been around quite a while. The economics are very difficult. Uh, it's been hard to build enough facilities to really make a difference. And there's other cool ideas around this carbon mineralization program, where instead of actually putting carbon dioxide underground, you actually chemically uh, uh, combine it with certain types of rocks and they turn into carbonates, you can potentially uh, sequester enormous volumes of CO2 in a solid form like that, uh, a very environmentally benign process, as long as you can do it without uh, expending a whole ton of energy. And finally, I just wanted to mention nuclear. Uh, here's a map of nuclear installations around the world, not surprisingly focused in Eastern North America and Europe and in China and Japan. And in July 2020, there were 408 nuclear reactors operating in 31 countries, which sounds like a lot, but it's actually 30 fewer than 19 or 18 years ago. Their total operating capacity is great, 362 gigawatts, and they're on stream about 84% of the time. They're highly reliable, dispatchable base load power. When you've got nuclear, you know the electricity is coming out. You're not worried about intermittency. And there are new technologies being developed. There's a lot of talk, particularly in Canada, about small modular reactors, reactors to put nuclear energy sources in remote communities or in places uh, where we don't need a huge big nuclear reactor. They might have a more uh, favorable technology in terms of uh, waste and, uh, and other environmental issues. So that's pretty cool stuff. And so why isn't nuclear more important? Well, there are many advocacy groups around for renewables that don't like nuclear. And they'll, they'll say it's because it's about accidents or about waste or things like that. And there are valid concerns about accidents and waste, but there are some very poorly communicated misconceptions around those issues. And I think that if we looked at uh, nuclear from a, a very dispassionate scientific point of view, we'd find that the, the risk levels are actually not nearly as bad as many people would like to say they are. But the reality is that the uh, it costs a lot of money to build nuclear installations and the regulatory requirements to ensure sufficient safety are extremely onerous, one reason that they're so expensive. And so new nuclear is not being built outside of China, pretty much. So let me wrap up. Energy transition is a critical global issue for humanity. It impacts just about everything important that we care about. Every energy source that we can talk about, whether it's oil or coal or solar or geothermal, has specific benefits and has significant costs and risks, both environmental and economic. Climate change is a critically important issue, but on a global basis, looking at the interests of people around the world, it's not the only issue. And in fact, in many, many parts of the world, and I'd suggest most of those parts of the world I showed you where people didn't have access to reliable electricity, energy poverty is a more pressing issue, as are nutrition, clean water, and health, all things that are brought around by a supply of reliable energy. So there are going to be people, and there are people, 
and countries and jurisdictions in the world that are building new coal-fired plants, new cast-fired plants. Uh, be, they, they understand the issues around emissions, but they also understand that they need the energy. Many of our uh, many uh, upper income countries like Canada and the United States are on reality one pathways. We're talking about reality two, but we're always talking about 10 years from now or 15 years from now. We're not, nobody's biting the bullet today. And so the pathways that we need to follow are not being followed because we're not biting the bullet today and doing the things that we would have to do to reach the targets that have been set in terms of emissions. And so, yeah, as, basically saying the same thing, the goals of reality two of rapid energy transition, whether that's to meet Paris emissions targets or to be zero net by um, 2050, are not supported by defined pathways. We've got these targets, we know where we want to go, but we don't know how we're going to get there. And we're still trying to figure that out as we go along. So panic solves nothing. Don't set your hair on fire. It just that's no solution. This is a time more than ever that we need to realize that energy supply controls humanity's futures and we need the best of our science, of our politics, of our uh, organizational, financial, business skills to meet needs and environmental impacts, to recognize reality and to communicate realities and facts to people. And the world is in tremendous difficulties today because of lack of realistic communications around these issues. Issues can be addressed and they will be addressed and energy transition will occur, but it's going to have to occur in a reasonable, fact-based, uh, scientifically and engineering possible manner. And I'll finish with a quote by Terry Edom, a local energy philosopher, real solutions engage all energy options. The false ones create villains. We need everybody firing on all cylinders, whether they're gas or electric cylinders, to make things work. So thanks very much. Thank you. And now we can move into the Q&A session. So uh, there's quite a few questions. So I'll probably pick and choose um, some of the best ones. And then the rest, um, I'll send it off to Brad. And then um, people who are watching can also kind of um, connect with all of our speakers as well. So um, do you think solar panels will ever get efficient enough from uh, the current about 22% efficiency to anything even near 50% efficiency? I'm not an expert on solar panels. My understanding is that there are actual physical, you know, physics limits to the efficiency that they can achieve. And I've read that those numbers are less than 30%. Um, but uh, I'm not an authority on that. Uh, I, I, I guess, the real answer is yes, there's still improvements to be made, but we've, we've improved so rapidly in the last 10 years. I think the idea that we can continue to improve at that pace is probably going to be limited by uh, the physical ceilings. Yes, um, I could probably answer a little bit about that too. Um, so the efficiency is 22%, but there are tracking options that can increase it, but it does come with, you know, the costs of having it move essentially. So. Even then, it doesn't get anywhere near 50 currently. Yeah, interesting stuff. Yeah. And mm -hmm. the second one is, do you think the transition to electrical cars will help or hurt the energy transition movement? The transition to electrical cars? Well, I think uh, if, if managed properly, it, I, I think that it can be very, uh, very helpful. Uh, I think the question is, can we get to the te technology to the point that the environmental impacts and, and the benefits of electrical vehicles are such that they clearly outcompete or outshine uh, internal combustion engines? In other words, we certainly understand that even with, uh, with advances in catalytic converters and things like that, that there's, there's emissions, both carbon dioxide and other things from uh, internal combustion engines, uh, manufacturing batteries, doing all the other things uh, in, in terms of mining and supply with EVs. Um, yeah, it, it's a bit of a trade-off now. I think at, at some point EVs will come out ahead, um, but exactly what the timing is, I'm not sure. And what I'm quite convinced of is that artificially imposing 
uh, um, deadlines like we're not going to allow sale of uh, internal combustion engines after 2030 or something like that are simply targets that have not been created with planning in mind as to how you're going to do that. All right. Awesome. Um, so the next question is, until the debacle in Texas, it was unthinkable energy and rich nations could face such a challenge. What do you think can be done to battle such a challenge in other nations um, and other places, especially Alberta? Well, the situation in Texas, I think, and also I think similarly, the situation that happened in California last summer, at least the Californians were fortunate enough that it was really hot instead of really cold when they lost access to power. But I think what it tells us is that, that uh, particularly as we move to greater and greater proportions of our energy being supplied by electricity, that those electrical systems have to be diverse and they have to be robust so that when something goes wrong, there's something else there to replace it. And there, there have to be questions asked, so how many you know, what what can we stand to uh, what what can we stand to uh, to compensate for? So, for example, all of the stuff that happened in Texas this week uh, probably happens five times a year in Alberta, and we just live with it because our systems are appropriately designed. But to design Texas's system, which probably has I don't know six or seven or ten times the capacity of Alberta's system. Um, would cost a lot of money and would be useful only once every whatever number of years, 30 or 40 years. So are they going to pay the cost? But assuming that they will pay the cost, the answers are more diversity, uh, better, uh, better look to robust performance under uh, in environmental conditions that are at least foreseeable, even if they don't happen very often. And I think the biggest thing is integration of electrical systems. My understanding was one of Texas's issues was that they keep their electrical grid independent of other states and so that they can't help each other out when problems occur. You know, for, you know it, it, we think in Canada, I mean, in Alberta, Alberta is connected uh, by interties to both, uh, well, to, uh, to BC, somewhat to Saskatchewan and also south into Montana. So that any one place uh, that's having an issue or capacity problems, can look to the other places and if they're able to help, they can help. So that increases the overall robustness of the system. So diversity and robustness and just better planning are, are keys. No simple answer. Mm. And in your opinion, what is the best resource to ensure we remain knowledgeable with the best and newest information about new innovations and solutions? <laughs> okay. Hi, Wendy. Sorry, I didn't catch the start of that. Could you repeat, please? Uh, so Wendy asked, in your opinion, what is the best resource to ensure we remain knowledgeable with the newest information about um, currents like innovations and solutions? Hmm. There's, <laughs> there, there's a lot of places to look. And again, because, because I think the, the energy solutions are so diverse, it's almost like you have to keep track of a whole bunch of, of different places. Uh, I subscribe to uh, a number of energy newsletters, um, out of most of them out of the States, but they're actually th these news gathering services and they bring together stories about new developments in, uh, uh, you know, new, new, or new uh, wind and solar projects or what different uh, areas are doing about their electrical systems or, or things like that. So I think those, uh, if you look at those sorts of newsletters, many of them are, you know, there are some promotion involved in them, but you get an idea of all the different things that are going on. Um, but there's certainly no one single place to look. Uh, there's just so much going on in so many different places in the world. I think that a lot of people, you know, here we are in Calgary and it's easy uh, situated next to the oil and gas industry to see many of the advances in emissions reductions and things like that associated with the oil and gas industry. But if you, yeah, if you don't read the right reports, you never hear about those things. So, right, so right. don't have a simple answer, but, but certainly some of these aggregate newsletters uh, and just look, you know, Google under energy and look for newsletters. I think there's a bunch of them that collect information that can keep you up to date. And last question before we close, uh, in your opinion, 
Is methane hydrate an alternative? If yes, where does Canada stand in terms of its potential and current progress? Methane hydrates? Yes. Was that what you, yeah. Um, well, the idea of, of uh, tapping into methane hydrates, uh, basically uh, methane frozen into water ice and most of it found in uh, uh, shallow subsurface or on the seafloor. Uh, it's an idea that's been around for quite a long time and there's been some piloting work on, done on it for decades. I know that uh, uh, Japanese uh, exploration company Japex uh, did a joint venture up in the Mackenzie Delta looking for gas hydrates just offshore there. Um, they, they, they have enormous potential in terms of the amount of natural gas that they have, but when, they, when you produce them, they are simply just natural gas. Uh, there's nothing magical, they're not lower emissions than any other natural gas. And quite frankly, I, I see any new work on methane hydrates slowing down simply because our natural gas uh, uh, sources and supplies since the advent of uh, hydraulic fracturing are so great onshore that it would be very, very difficult to uh, bring on methane hydrates to compete at all. Mm. Awesome. Uh, yeah, so I think great. that's the last question. Um, are there okay. any closing remarks, Brad? Oh, are you okay? Uh, yep, sorry, I just need my water here. Uh, no, I think, uh, thank you very much, uh, everyone for attending. Appreciate the questions. If there are more questions or comments, uh, I'd, I'd uh, appreciate seeing them. I think uh, they can be posted through the conference website or could come through you, Ruo, is that right? Yes, um, and I believe yeah. your profile is in there as well. So mm, if they want right. to like LinkedIn, it's also there. Perfect, yeah, I'd love to hear from people. It's, uh, uh, we only learn by continuing to exchange ideas. Mm, definitely. Well, thank yeah. you so much for um, joining us today, Brad. And thank I you. will end it here then. Okay, bye-bye.